My Lords, before I call the Leader of the House to begin the tributes to the late Sir David Amos MP, I'd like to make some short remarks of my own. Sir David was not a member of this House, but he was one of us. He was a true parliamentarian. He was also an exemplar of decency and courtesy. When I entered Parliament in 1987, Sir David had already served in the Commons for four years. Very quickly, I found myself working with him on cross-party and international issues and on social campaigns and causes that promoted the common good. David relished working across the party divides. He was not tribal. As an example to the society we live in, he embraced minorities and was tolerant, not intolerant. His willingness to reach out and to engage with those he represented went to the heart of what he considered to be his vocation in life. He could never have been accused of being remote or detached. He championed private members' bills on animal welfare and on fuel poverty, always speaking up for his constituents and placing their concerns at the heart of his work here in Westminster. He was well known in his local area and was keen to engage the local press in his many campaigns. His frequent engagement with the sub-editors obviously paid off when one headline following a trip to Rome read, Pope Francis meets David Amos. <laughs> His character was well known. At the weekend, I heard one TV commentator refer to him as a little eccentric. Well, if that was the case, I declare long live eccentrics. Yeah. Not once did I meet him in these corridors over the 34 years we served together without being met with an enormous smile as he bounded towards me with a spring in his step. He had an ability to make every encounter bright something which reminded me time and time again of the inherent goodness of humanity. Today, Parliament mourns. We join with his family, his friends, his staff, and those who knew him and worked with him. It is right that we conclude our proceedings today by joining together with the House of Commons to pray for him, to remember him, and to celebrate all that he was and all that he gave to this place and to the nation. I now call on the Lord Privy Seal. <laughs> like all noble lords, I was shocked, shaken and saddened by the tragic death of Sir David Amos on Friday. He was killed while holding a constituency surgery in a place of sanctuary, serving the residents of South End West, as he had done proudly since 1997. <laughs> as the Lord Speaker said, Sir David was a veteran parliamentarian of almost four decades, who was admired and respected across both Houses of Parliament. Only three other sitting MPs have served the House of Commons and their constituents longer than Sir David had. A working-class boy from the East End of London, Sir David was first elected in Basildon in 1983. A bellwether seat for the 1992 general election, he held on with the backing of Essex men and women and provided the pivotal moment of the night Sir John Major won an unexpected majority. At the 1997 general election, Sir David moved to the neighbouring constituency of South End West. And of course, our very own noble lady, Lady Smith, followed Sir David as the MP for Basildon. She tells me that she soon discovered one of Sir David's traditions was giving students a spelling test on primary school visits. 
Apparently, he had a preoccupation with two words in particular, and the local schools had posters of them plastered all over the walls <laughs> to ensure their students were ready to impress their visiting MP. So I understand there is a certain cohort educated in South Essex who have Sir David to thank for being able to spell the words yacht and unnecessary correctly. <laughs> in his new seat, Sir David continued his tradition of campaigning in a motorhome, playing his song, which I can assure noble lords I am not going to attempt to sing, but went, vote, vote for David Amos. David is the man for you. If you want to be true blue and to air your points of view, then David Amos is the only man for you. Although his campaign style was compared to that of an ice cream vendor, it was authentically Sir David, and it worked. Throughout his parliamentary career, he was well known as a dedicated Brexiteer, a doughty animal rights campaigner, a devout Roman Catholic, and a devoted constituency chairman. It is true to say that he achieved more on the back benches than many of us ministers managed to achieve in government, piloting numerous private members' bills, such as those on cruel tethering and warm homes into law, helping ensure that Raoul Wallenberg and his bravery was recognised with a memorial statue, and organising for 200 inspirational students from the Music Man Project to perform at the Royal Albert Hall and again at the London Palladium. And of course, I don't think there can be anyone in this House who is not aware of Sir David's campaign to make Southend a city, a campaign he pursued doggedly and determinedly, but with the humour and warmth that characterised his approach, because above all, he was a kind, generous and decent human being. So I'm delighted to tell the House, if you did not know already, that the Prime Minister has confirmed Her Majesty the Queen has agreed that Southend will be accorded the city status yeah. it so clearly deserves. My Lords, I was not lucky enough to have known Sir David well personally, but from the stories I have read from colleagues, friends and strangers over the weekend, it is clear he was a wonderful man who touched the lives of many. So many colleagues have commented on his love of being a parliamentarian. Whether in the House or his beloved constituency, he had as much joy and enthusiasm in his fourth decade in the job as he did in his first. And that enthusiasm was infectious to all with whom he served. A former colleague of mine from Policy Exchange, who began his career working for Sir David, shared what many have commented was an accurate reflection of his character. Not being bothered about missing or even returning a call from David Cameron, the then Prime Minister, yet turning his office upside down to find a missing local charity invitation for a duck race and moving heaven and earth at all hours of the day for constituents in need. My husband James joined the House of Commons following the last election and experienced Sir David's generosity of friendship firsthand. They spent some time together recently discussing Sir David's new book, Eyes and Ears, during lockdown as part of his virtual book tour. With great humour and a big smile on his face, Sir David's opening line of, now then, James, someone told me that you sleep with a member of the Cabinet, was, I think it fair to say, not the introduction that James was expecting. <laughs> In his book, Sir David asked how someone like him, born into relative poverty and with no great political helping hand, became a Conservative Member of Parliament. The many thousands of people he helped and the causes he supported will be forever grateful that he did make that journey from those humble beginnings in Plaistow. And as would be expected from Sir David, the proceeds of his book will go to three charities whose causes he consistently championed, Endometriosis UK, Prostate and the Music Man Project. I stand here today as not just the leader of this House, but as the wife of an MP. I see the vital work they do, day in, day out, on the front line, to help some of the most vulnerable people in society. Listening and offering support, speaking up for those without a voice, all to serve the people in their constituencies, regardless of how they voted. And of course, many of your Lordships here today, that was your daily reality when you served in the other place. Alongside Joe Cox, 
We now have had the horror of two MPs in the last five years killed while doing their jobs, simply serving the constituents they were elected to do. And one of our own colleagues, the noble Lord, Lord Jones of Cheltenham, was badly injured and his aide, Andrew Pennington, killed in a horrific act of violence. Any attack on any parliamentarian is an attack on our democracy. All of us, across both houses, across all parties and groups, stand together in condemnation of these senseless and callous attacks. It is right that the security measures in place for MPs are reviewed, but we cannot allow these dreadful events to break the close link between MPs and their constituents, which is so central to our democracy. It has been a devastating week for our party, our parliament and our country. First with the loss of our dear friend James Brokenshire, and now the much-loved Sir David Amos. Both men taken from us too soon and with so much more to give. But today, I know I speak on behalf of the whole House when I say that our deepest sympathies are with Sir David's family, friends and staff, especially his wife Julia and their five children. We have lost a dedicated public servant and a colleague, but they have lost a husband and a father. I hope they can find some comfort in our admiration and respect for the most decent of men. Sir David's family have called on everyone to set aside their differences and show kindness and love to all, something we should all reflect on. I know there are many noble lords who wish to speak today who had the honour of knowing Sir David much better than me, and I look forward to learning more about him from them. But I have no doubt that we can all learn from Sir David's example of compassion, kindness and public service. Yeah. Yeah. Lords, I think the whole House welcomed the noble lady's very emotional and very genuine fond tribute to Sir David. My Lords, as the news unfolded on Friday that Sir David Amos had been attacked, our hope that he hadn't been seriously hurt we were mixed with that dreadful feeling we had in the pit of our stomachs that something deeply shocking and terrible had happened. And when it was confirmed that he had not survived, it was hard to find the words to convey our feelings about this act of devastating horror. My Lords, we send our deepest and heartfelt condolences to Sir David's wife Julia, their children, their wider family, and also his many friends and colleagues. Their loss is profound and it's overwhelming. Also, we just feel for the staff that were with him at the time. The emotional shock that they suffered will be deeply felt for a long time. And my Lords, may I take this opportunity, as Noble Lady did, to express our sadness and condolences on the death of another Conservative MP, James Brokenshire. It's a cruel connection that James also had strong Essex links, having been born in Southend and previously represented Hornchurch. Both men, as the noble ladies said, have left us too soon and had so much more to give. I first met Sir David Amos in 1983 when he famously achieved that remarkable victory that many thought impossible in winning the newly drawn parliamentary constituency of Basildon, where there wasn't a single Conservative councillor. At the time, I was living in South End and working for the League Against Cruel Sports. David was one of a then small group from his party, strongly supporting our campaign to ban fox hunting and hare coursing. He remained passionately committed to the welfare of animals. Indeed, his recent final comments in Parliament, though none of us knew they would be so, were to urge for debate on animal welfare. Over the years, our paths crisscrossed in Basildon, Southend and Westminster, and just occasionally on the same side of an issue. Leaving Basildon for Southend, was both painful and an opportunity for him. As with everything else, he embraced his new constituency with enthusiasm, commitment and genuine affection, and has been clear from the response of his constituents it was warmly reciprocated. Throughout his nearly 40-year time in Parliament, he was a formidable campaigner on a range of issues, and they were usually triggered by a constituent who had come to him for help. At the end of the term in the House of Commons, Sir David would always be there until the very end, making the most of an opportunity to speak on the adjournment debate, on the constituency issues that were closest to his heart. There were often a lot of them. 
His last opportunity to do so was on the 22nd of July this year. With just a three-minute time limit, you had to smile and admire that he managed to raise the issues of care home costs, building regulations and accessibility, zero carbon emissions, energy costs, and gas boilers and tidal power and jet skis, <laughs> and single-use plastic, sewage discharge, the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, and trees in South End, and the export of live animals, <laughs> the pension ombudsman, charity raising by a constituent, vulnerable children, the Olympics and Paralympics, the Royal British Legion, a memorial to Dame Vera Lynn, and he finished, we must make Southend a city. <laughs> My Lord, some made the mistake of not initially taking his Southend campaign seriously, but he was totally committed. A few weeks ago, he formally launched the bid for city status, and in typical <coughs> Sir David style, it was quite an occasion with the town crier and local dignitaries all there in South End in support. The council leader, Ian Gilbert, told me that Sir David arranged everything, saying of the event, it had a serious purpose, but it was also a great sense of fun, which is the hallmark of Sir David's work. And my lords, as we heard from the whole house, how much we enjoy that the Queen has now given permission for South End to become a city. What a great tribute that will be well received, not just in South End, but across the whole of South Essex. Yeah. My Lords, to those who knew him best, it comes as no surprise that so many shared their experience of acts of kindness and support from David when they needed it the most. A good friend of mine, South End Labour Councillor Julian Ware Lane, was David's opponent in the 2015 and 2017 general elections. Julian tragically died before his 60th birthday. David's thoughtfulness and kindness, including visiting Julian in hospital, was not something most people knew about, but it meant so much to Julian and to his friends and his family. From accounts over the weekend, it's clear this was not a random act, but it was part and parcel of how Sir David lived his life. The Mayor of South End, Councillor Margaret Bolton, spoke for the whole town and wider in saying, to have him taken away in this manner is a tragedy for our community. It's too easy and too lazy for some to be cynical about MPs, councillors, and indeed all politicians. At its most benign, it's uninformed and unfair. At its worst, it has devastating and heartbreaking consequences. We will celebrate Sir David's life and his achievements, although today we mourn his loss. And we also mourn the loss of what this attack represents. The similarities of the murder to, Joe, to David and Joe Cox are deeply disturbing. Like so many other MPs, they put their heart and soul into being the best that they could be. And that means the face-to-face -face engagement with constituents, many of whom will become friends. Those meetings, events, surgeries, visiting schools, factories, businesses, even being stopped in the supermarket, are all part and parcel of being a local MP at the heart of your community. It's just over five years ago that we gathered here to pay our tributes following the mindless and needless violence that had taken Jo's life. For her family, and indeed for her sister Kim, who now represents the constituency, the manner of Sir David's death brings back all that horror and fear. I said then, when good people of passion and principle tell their families and friends they want to be a councillor or an MP, I want their families to be proud of them, not to fear for them. This is the third time since then that this House has paid tribute to a dedicated public servant colleague who was killed in the line of duty. Joe Cox MP in 2016, PC Keith Palmer in 2017, and today Sir David Amos. They were killed because they embodied the best of selfless public service. Others will recall previous attack, not least that on Nigel Jones, now a member of your Lordship's House, when Andrew Pennington was killed in 2000, and the attempted murder of Stephen Timmers MP in 2010. And yet, here we are again. Again, we're talking about dialing down the toxicity of debate in modern politics. Again, we're talking about how social media, especially when used anonymously, can be chilling and scary. And again, we're talking about how we respect and protect our MPs. My Lord, the talk has to stop. It's not enough. 
My Lords, on behalf of these benches, we pay tribute to the life and work of Sir David Amos and offer our condolences to those who knew and loved him. My Lords, I, I begin by um, joining the Leader uh, and the Leader of the Opposition in expressing my condolences and those of my colleagues um, to the family and personal friends of Sir David and to his wider family, the constituents of South End West. My Lords, for Liberal Democrats of my generation, the point at which da Sir David first made an impression on us was on General Election Polling Day in 1992. I was with Paddy Ashdown in his cottage near uh, Yeovil on polling night. Michael Burke had a BBC camera in the street outside. The opinion polls were suggesting a hung parliament, and we were naturally extremely excited at this prospect. <laughs> Until, my lords, the first result of the evening from a Conservative health seat came in, namely Basildon, and the smiling features uh, of Sir David confounded the predictions of the exit polls and our hopes. Michael Burke folded up his equipment and slunk away. <laughs> Sir David's delight counterpoised our disappointment. In the years since, I've had little personal contact with Sir David, but a surprising number of my colleagues in your Lordship's house have. <coughs> In work ranging from the Industry and Parliament Trust, <coughs> Iran Freedom Movement, to the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Fire and Rescue, they share a common reflection that he was a lovely person, courteous, entertaining and completely devoted to, saving the, to serving the public good and his constituents. In short, my lords, he had exactly the qualities which people <coughs> wish to see in their elected representatives. And he will certainly be greatly missed equally in Westminster and South End. Today, as we remember Sir David, our minds inevitably turn to the murder of Joe Cox, the deadly attack involving my colleague Lord Jones of Cheltenham, and the attack on Stephen Timms. And after each of these terrible incidents, there was understandable soul-searching on why the attack happened and how similar attacks might be avoided in future. And the same thoughts are in our minds today. It's obviously appropriate that there's a review of the security of MPs to see what additional measures might be taken which are consistent with MPs being able to continue to meet their constituents and hear their concerns. We in your Lordship's House are in a somewhat more fortunate position than our MP colleagues. Although, like them, we may receive abusive emails, or at least I do every time I make a speech about Brexit, <laughs> threats to our physical safety are, I believe, pretty rare. We are therefore largely bystanders in the formal security review. But for anybody involved in politics at any level, I think this tragedy should give us pause to consider how we conduct ourselves and the contribution we make to the heat generated by public debate. As we do, we might start by heeding the words of the Amos family and think about how we embody them in the way we go about our business. The family have said that they want, and I quote, people to set aside their differences and show kindness and love to all. Be tolerant and try to understand. My Lords, in politics, it's not always possible to set aside differences altogether. But it is always possible to show kindness and consideration to all. My Lords, there could be no better way of respecting the memory of Sir David than to make tolerance and kindness our watchwords as we face the challenges of the months ahead. Yeah. My Lords, so many of you know Sir David, or knew Sir David, that I shall be brief. But on behalf of the crossbenchers, we respectfully and mournfully join in and associate ourselves with the expressions of condolence and sympathy for Lady Amos and her family in what is obviously a calamitous loss. A loss I suspect made much more poignant by the fact of the time when it happened, the occasion when it happened, and the cruel circumstances in which it happened. 
an MP for 40 years cut down doing his, while doing his job, and an MP on all accounts who had that wonderful additional, additional attribute beyond the needs of each and every one of his constituents of having an independent mind. Mm. And um, everything I've read about him tells me that he did. He was his own person. And we need members of parliament like that. Mm. My lords, as I say, I didn't know him. I know that the Reverend Primate, the Archbishop of York, will be speaking soon, and he was a personal friend, so you'll want to hear from him and not from me. But I must add something. Can we think about the way in which we deal with these issues ourselves? Can we reflect on the impact on the House of Commons rather than on this place? Can we reflect, and I do with sympathy and concern for the other place, about the troublesome paradox that it seems to require a catastrophic disaster like this murder or the murder of Joe Cox to bring back to mind, to highlight before the public, the societal contribution, the contribution to the welfare of the nation that is going on with 650 elected members of parliament sitting in the other place. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, we owe them rather more, do we not, than a fleeting acknowledgement on an emotionally induced occasion. And if we could retain, recover, find a way in which the public appreciated what our members of parliament do, we would be living in a much happier society. You don't have to agree with your MP, but you do have to respect him yeah, yeah. or her. My lords, for today though, you've heard enough from me. Our thoughts from these benches are with Sir David's family, his wife, his friends, many of you in this chamber, and let us not overlook the unhappy people who were there very close to the scene at the time. Uh, my Lords, on behalf of the Archbishop of Canterbury and the bishops of the Church of England, and I'm sure all Christian people and all people of goodwill, um, I'm here to offer Sir David Amos's family and the constituents of South End West my condolences and the assurance of the prayers of the church and I'm very very grateful for all that's been said thus far and certainly we wish to associate ourselves on these benches with those comments as was said I, I considered uh, David Amos a friend uh, Leon C is my hometown um, uh, South End now the city of South End is where I grew up uh, this appalling murder happened in streets I know well, just around the corner from where my mum lives. Um, and it was characteristic of David, whom I got to know during my time as Bishop of Chelmsford, uh, that when I was appointed, he was one of the first people to congratulate me. Uh, when I was translated to York, it was the same. Uh, he, was, he thought this was another way of putting South End on the map, that a boy... <laughs> A boy who went to a secondary modern school in South End was now the 98th Archbishop of York. He was so pleased. Um, last time I saw him, he said, could, could he have his photograph taken with me? Um, and, um, you know, I, I reckon um, that now South End's been declared a city today, forget about a statue of Vera Lynn, at Dover, we're going to put a statue of David Amos at the end of South End Pier. Yeah. Um, so, um, he was, and I know this from the work I did with him, a deeply, deeply committed constituency MP. Um, he exemplified um, what that means. <coughs> he knew the people he served, and in the constituency, he was completely colour blind to political difference. He just served the people that he'd been elected to serve. But I do want to say this. Hate cannot win. It may score many points. It may land many punches. But it can't win. Because trusting no one, hate 
just ends up with endless divisions and suspicions, and in the end, it just consumes itself. Um, sorry, I'm going to go into sermon mode just for a moment, <laughs> sisters and brothers. <laughs> Love is always stronger. It's always more tenacious. Its patient endurance draws us together. And by love, I don't just mean warm feelings of well-disposed goodwill, but that deeply committed determination to get up each morning and live what you believe in. Put the needs of others before yourself. Recognise our common humanity. That's where the word kindness comes from. It's linked to the word kin. It means we belong to each other. We serve the common good. We know that our best interests are absolutely interwoven with the interests of others. And they lead to those things, those values, that vision, which is worth living for. Now, this love is what we see on these benches in Jesus Christ. And it was that love and that faith in Christ within the community of the church which was the source and sustenance of David Amos's vision and values. It was this that enabled him to reach across party political divides. Get on well with everyone. Exhibit a good humoured generosity and a kindness that is, sadly, sadly, often woefully lacking in public and political discourse today. My Lords, these same values, this same vision are held in our democracy. They require us to listen and to love one another, especially those with whom we differ and disagree, and to attend to each other's needs and serve the common good. They call us to speak kindly of each other, to think well of each other, and to act generously. And it's because Sir David Amis so exemplified those things, regardless of what his politics happened to be, he exemplified these things, and that's the reason that we are so easily able to come together and remember him. Esteem his contribution to public life, mourn his death, but not be defeated by the hatred that killed him. Could I conclude with some words I wrote in a newspaper yesterday about his faith. Uh, David Amos didn't actually wear his faith on his sleeve. He wore it in his heart. And that is the best place for faith. Because when you wear it in your heart, it shapes everything. Yeah. My lords, I will be calling three remote contributions before opening up to the rest of the house. Baroness Brinton. My lords, my noble friend Lord Jones of Cheltenham cannot be in his place today, but has asked me to start by saying something on his behalf about Sir David Amis. As noble lords have already heard, Lord Jones was himself attacked and his aide and friend Councillor Andy Pennington killed at a constituency surgery in the year 2000. Lord Jones wants me to say on his behalf, to learn that David's life has been taken is the most unimaginable shock. I simply can't believe that this has happened again and to the kindest, most decent of men. He was a mate, David. We are on opposite sides of every debate. He voted the wrong way on most things and disagreed with me on just about everything. We were in different parties, but always got on well. He was a wonderful personality and worked exceptionally hard for his constituents. He was a proper parliamentarian, a dedicated public servant and a lovely man. If he bumped into me when he had visitors to the house, he'd say, oh, and this is my friend Nigel. He was attacked, you know. Do you remember he was on the television? I'm appalled that he has suffered like this. David, like my friend Andy Pennington and I, was just trying to do the job to the best of his ability. 
Our democracy relies on an open channel between those in power and the people who we represent. It's vital to be able to meet people face to face so they can feel we are here and working for them. My Lords, turning to my own tribute, I first got to know Sir David when I joined your Lordship's house a decade ago, and he quickly nobbled me, there is no other word, to join the all party group for fire safety and rescue, which he chaired. I really didn't have a choice. He had been a friend of my father, Tim Brinton, having met when they were MPs together. And David knew that my stepmother, Jeanne, had been a Conservative chairman of the Kent Fire Safety Committee, and that I had campaigned actively for sprinklers in schools. But that was David. Every argument, well-researched, compliments paid, and before I knew it, I was even an officer of the All Party Group too. And to the utter amusement of the much younger members of the All Party Group and to visiting experts, he usually introduced me as Tim Brinton's daughter, which always made me very proud. Their friendship was based on rejecting preferment, but loving the core job of being an MP, both in the constituency and in the House. Over the decade that followed, I saw his campaigning zeal through the work of the All Party Group, holding ministers and sector professionals to account. I have to say that schools fire minister after schools fire minister and building planning minister after building planning minister were truly held to account in David's inimitable style. And of course, our work became even more important after the tragedy of the Grenville fire and still is not over. We will carry it on in his memory. My Lords, many have spoken since Friday of David's kindness, decency, courtesy and humour. I have seen all in plenty. I was unwell for a large part of last year and he rang me regularly to check on my progress. And I want to send my deepest sympathy to Julia, their children, his wider family and all his staff and colleagues. In this day and age of daily abuse, online and in person, death threats, attacks and even murders, he stood as an oasis of reasonable behaviour and genuine affection for all those who crossed his path. In 2017, Christians in Politics ran a campaign for learning to disagree well. I cannot think of a better example than David of always disagreeing well. In political terms, we were polar opposites, but with him, that was never a barrier. He always found what we had in common and we could stand together. His faith was intrinsic to every action, every word he uttered, and every passing smile to faces that he recognised. May he rest in peace and rise in glory. Lady Harris, you're ready to go. My Lords, we never discuss politics. David knew mine and I his. And it was always like that over the years we worked together. He succeeded me as chair of the Industry and Parliament Trust in 2014, having been a board member himself for a number of years previously. I always valued his contributions, if not always the way he put them. I well recall him saying to me before one meeting with that lovely crinkly smile on his face and his eyes twinkling. Now, Angela, this, is going to, this isn't going to take too long, is it? The agenda, my Lord, was huge. Nick Marr, the Trust's chief executive, told me a lovely story which epitomised David. He was introducing the Lord Mayor of London at an event and said, I would like to introduce the Lord Mayor. Of course, none of us can aspire to be Lord Mayor because we don't have enough money and didn't go to the right school. The room went very quiet. That was so David. You never really knew what he might say next. 
I know that Nick would also want me to say that David would always go that extra mile for the IPT, was adored by the staff there and worked enormously hard for the trust, which he continued to chair until 2017. We also worked together with the British Parliamentary Committee for Iran Freedom. David was passionate about the Iranian resistance movement and we shared many platforms together over the years. His commitment to everything he campaigned for was inspiring. He was a kind, funny and thoughtful man, dedicated to his beloved South End, which I often teased him about as I had worked at the airport there in my younger days. He was totally without malice or nastiness and always charmed everyone with whom he came into contact. It is almost impossible to believe that anyone would want to harm him, let alone attack him so brutally and fatally. He was a true parliamentarian who lived for his family and for his constituency in that order. And his loss to us is deeply felt and incredibly painful. Uh, my lords, as many people, I was especially shocked and saddened when I heard of the terrible murder of David whilst helping his people. I had the privilege of working with him over liver disease and hepatitis C. He was always cheerful and good to be with. We shared the interest of animals and the same faith. We are the poorer of having lost two very good members of parliament doing their work. I send my heartfelt condolences to his family. And I ask, could priests be allowed to attend at a crime scene so that they can give the victim the last rites, especially when they are dying. My lords, thank you. Lords, I open to the house. My lords, David Amos and I entered the House of Commons together at the 1983 general election. So he was my colleague and friend for nearly 40 years. He was, as so many others have said, a really lovely man. He was one of that select band of people who was truly life-enhancing. When you left a meeting with David, even a chance encounter, you felt happier and better than you had felt before. He was one of those rare human beings who looked for the best in others, and in doing so, brought out the best in them. He was a living antidote to the cynicism with which so many regard politics and politicians. I join with so many others in expressing my heartfelt sympathy to his family. He was, of course, a conservative, and his conservative beliefs were deeply held, truly felt, but of course they didn't, as so many have said this afternoon, they didn't in any way prove an impediment to his working with others across party for the causes in which he believed. This appalling tragedy has focused attention on the constituency role which was the core of David's parliamentary life. It is one of the great strengths of our parliamentary democracy that every member of the House of Commons represents a constituency and in my opinion, and on the basis of my 27 years in that house, the constituency surgery plays a key role in the bond between a member of parliament and his or her constituents. It ensures 
that whatever our failings, and heaven knows there are many of them, it is really quite difficult for a Member of Parliament to be out of touch. Many years ago, not long after President George Bush Sr. had failed in his bid to be re-elected, I was visited by a presidential contender from the United States. He asked what plans I had for the weekend, and I explained that I would be in my constituency holding my surgeries. He asked what they were. He was very puzzled. And when I explained, expressed his surprise that a cabinet minister, which I was at the time, would be spending his weekend in this kind of activity. If George Bush's cabinet had held surgeries, he said, he would still be president. <laughs> so although I have no doubt that measures can be taken to improve the security and safety of members of parliament, I hope that nothing will be done to weaken the links between members and their constituents in which surgeries play such an important part. <clears throat> That would be the very opposite of the legacy which David Amos so richly deserves. Yeah. Uh, my Lords, uh, I uh, knew David Amos when he first came in because I was elected before him. And so for nearly 40 years, I was on good and friendly terms with him as a parliamentary colleague. And I'm as shocked as anybody in this House that such a man should come to such a terrible end. Uh, the fact is we're, we're all saying the same things about him. And the tributes that were paid publicly last week by various people repeated the same points. And as others would wish to join, I won't repeat them all. The fact is that the reason is that on this case, in the case and they're all true. We have a very good convention in this country that when anybody dies, if you have to pay tribute to them, you find something polite to, to say. And <laughs> I have heard people say very, very moving things about people who I know privately they thought were rather nasty pieces of work. <laughs> They're sympathetic when they died. What David Amis, as everybody has said, and for the sake of others I won't just repeat it all, the first words that come to mind, or variants of them, when you think of him, was a very, very nice man. I can't believe that a man like that ever actually had an enemy. And that applied to his political life as much as to his private life. Uh, people from across the other side of the aisle from him, people who, different parties who agree profoundly with him, have said these things. I, too, was a Conservative, but it can't be said that David and I were on the same wing of the <laughs> broad coalition, which is the Conservative Party, as it is of all our political parties in this country. He was a very, very fierce Eurosceptic. He was a great supporter of capital punishment, which were opinions which, to put it lightly, I do not share. But he was one of that group, and it's the majority of British politicians, who would never have dreamt of allowing political disagreement to interfere with personal friendship, who actually respected the true right of free speech, which is you respect the integrity and the sincerity of the person with whom you're having an argument, and you maintain <coughs> civilised dialogue in a free society. Uh, he was also an enthusiast, a hard-working, enthusiastic backbencher who never betrayed the slightest interest in uh, being a, such a keen party man that he was seeking preferment. He, he always had campaigns. I won't list the ones that I've encountered over the years. He, he, he always, at any given stage, had quite a lot of campaigns that he was pursuing. And he pursued them all with the same energy and enthusiasm. And his personality, which was always amusing and engaging and everything else was one of the things that actually forwarded what he was trying to argue for and help recruitment to it. So uh, I join in all the sympathies of his family and agree that the tragedy of this latest uh, 
disaster for our democracy and for our parliament is that his, the victim is one of the very nicest political practitioners of any political view that I have encountered and most of us encountered and it's a truly moving occasion. Just a word on the wider things. You can never make controversial figures like members of parliament totally safe and there's an element, a minor, quite acceptable degree of risk uh, for any member of parliament, however obscure, however quiet. Uh, we've always had a fringe of violence in recent years. People have talked of the most recent four attacks, knife attacks, all by lunatic madmen. I think in my time in the House of Commons I lost about six of my colleagues who were killed by IRA terrorists and others. Uh, the most well-known occasions were the Brighton bomb and the murder of Mary Neve in the Palace of Westminster. And uh, th there were others. I haven't counted them all. Uh, and uh, you have to have precautions against them. We always have had to have them. When I was a controversial prominent figure, uh, there were several weeks when the Nottinghamshire police advised me they'd like to have a special branch policeman sitting in the outer office of my surgery. Nothing ever came of it. The death threats I got were usually obviously from harmless lunatics just trying to frighten or offend me. Uh, but it's, uh, there's a, a, to a certain extent, it's difficult to minimise. And I fear that whereas the IRA were at least predictable, they had a coherent political agenda and were determined to use terrorist violence to advance it, nowadays it's loners, fanatics, madmen, people with perverted views of their own. And it's very difficult to guarantee security against such people. But I'll only echo what everybody else has said about the contribution that political debate can make. I think the deteriorating tone of debate over the last 10, 20 years is somehow encouraging these mad loners to start emerging and becoming active. The, the absurd cynicism of the public towards the political class. The majority of the public, if you tell them that most MPs are all crooks, they're only in it for what they're getting out of it, it doesn't matter who you vote for, I fear a majority of the population would, in casual conversation, agree to that, which is a <coughs> bizarre and ridiculous and untrue allegation. Standards of honesty, actually, in House of Commons are rather higher on average than the standards of honesty amongst the general public, although all groups have scoundrels and the House of Commons has always, always had one or two. But I think the actual public exchange of views has become nastier, simpler. Politicians themselves are partly to blame. The social media has had a dreadful effect on the tenor of debate. Yeah, yeah. And I think the media themselves give more yeah. courage to the lunatic fringe on the edge of perfectly good lobbies than they do to the people arguing the cause. And we all as parliamentarian have to retain the standards that we undoubtedly do and mourn the loss of a very great, very nice, hard-working parliamentarian. Yeah. <laughs> to associate myself with the remarks of Noble Lord Lord Clark of Nottingham, particularly about the declining standard of political debate, but he was right also to remind us of the high price which so many in politics have to pay. I was indeed elected to the House of Commons in 1979 on the very day before Airy Neve was murdered in the precincts of Parliament. It was with profound and aching sorrow that I heard the shocking news on Friday that Sir David Amos MP had been murdered. Over the past 40 years, David and I had become close friends and I've shared many platforms with him in his constituency and elsewhere. We both had our working class origins in the East End of London and indeed were baptised within a year of one another in the same church by the same Franciscan priest. He often joked that there must have been something in the holy water. <laughs> uh, my lords, his faith was in his DNA and it animated his belief in public service and in the principle of duty. I first met David when he came into the House in 1983. From across the House, we joined forces in taking up the case of Ralph Allenberg, the Swedish diplomat who saved thousands of 
Jewish lives from Nazis, and in 1997, thanks to David's assiduous campaign, a statue was erected to Wallenberg outside the Western Marble Arch Synagogue. There were other campaigns about Soviet Jewry, about the plight of Alexandra Ogorodnikov, the Russian Orthodox dissident, and we frequently shared platforms to highlight persecution of people because of freedom of religion or belief, or because of human rights violations, especially as we've heard from others, the situation in Iran. David's faith informed his passionate commitment to the very right to life, to human dignity, and to the common good. But it was also rooted in his absolute conviction that an MP's first priority was to their constituents. It was the death of the constituent from hypothermia, which led to his successful <laughs> private member's bill on fuel poverty. Just a few weeks ago, David asked me to take part in the launch of his memoir, Eyes and Ears. Typical of David's kindness and generosity, as we heard from the Leader of the House, the proceeds of the book were dedicated to three charities, Endometricosis UK, Prostate and the Lee on Sea based Music Man project. David's causes were rooted in the neighbourhoods and in the people that he represented. His commitment to direct face-to-face -face engagement, which the noble Lord, Lord Howard has been right to remind us, is at the very heart, the essence of being a member of Parliament. Indeed, the noble Lord contested the constituency that I was ultimately elected in, in a previous general election. And he knows, as I know, that it is a precious relationship that you have with your constituents. But now it's taken David's life, as it took the life of Joe Cox, as the noble Baroness Lady Smith reminded us, and Andy Pennington. And if it hadn't been for a mercifully foiled plot, it would have also led to the murder of another friend since teenage days, Rosie Cooper, the Labour Member of Parliament for West Lancashire. But as Mr Speaker, Sir Lindsay Hoyle has rightly said, heinous crimes must not be allowed to drain the lifeblood from our representative democracy. This was an attack on democracy itself. We would be making a terrible mistake and I know it's not what David would have wanted for his death to simply lead to more barriers being put between the people yeah. and their representatives. Yeah, yeah. My Lords, we will all want to understand the killer's motivations to delve deeper into the failure of the Prevent programme, to understand the radicalisation which takes place in our prisons and also through the promotion of intolerant, toxic and violent ideologies, sometimes with the indulgence of social media. Our thoughts today should also be with every family in this country, far too many of whom have lost loved ones to knife crime. As David's family said in a statement today, people of faith from all the great religions and people of no faith must work much harder to create a more respectful society which honours difference. Too often we have been in denial about the sources of the hateful threats to the foundations of a liberal, open and pluralistic society as David's horrific death demonstrates, notwithstanding all the good in the world, we still have the capacity to do truly evil things. His death reminds us of the deep-seated challenges we face. Above all, it will have devastating consequences for his family and loved ones. And my principal thoughts and prayers today are with Julia and with their children. May this good man now rest in peace. My Lord, my Lord I will be brief to allow other colleagues to <coughs> say a few words. Uh, on this sad occasion, uh, when we mourn the death of our colleague, I remember a smile, the smile of David Amies. I've known David for some 15 years. I never saw him without that smile on his face. I never heard in those years a bad word said about him. And how could there have been? Because he was, in the true sense of the word, a true and perfect Christian gentleman. I remember fondly an all-party delegation to the <coughs> Philippines led by David. It was an honour and privilege to be part, part and be with him. He moulded a very diverse group of parliamentarians into a very united group. And his personality and charm and smile charmed the pants of all the Philippine members that we met both ministers and parliamentary delegates, delegates. As has been mentioned by many, Sir David had many interests, and one was a keen and abiding interest in Northern Ireland. Each time we met, 
either the first or second sentence he would say was, well, Dennis, how's Northern Ireland and how can I help? My lords, Lady Amos has lost a husband. His children have lost a father. We have, as parliamentarians, have lost a colleague. Northern Ireland has lost a friend. David, we all miss you. My lords, um, as time is short, I'm not going to say very much about David because so much has been said already. But we both entered the House of Commons on the same day with uh, my noble friend, Lord Howard. Um, David served for 38 years. I lasted uh, 14 before I was asked to leave. <laughs> I have to say, I'm grateful for that in some ways because I missed out on the cesspit, which is social media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I went on Twitter um, for about three months. It was as much as I could stand. Um, not that it was all directed at me particularly, but it is a cancer at the heart of our political system. Yeah, and the fact that yeah, people are able to yeah. write this stuff yeah. without being accountable for it and anonymously yeah. is something that needs to be changed. Yeah. What I did want to say is David was an exceptional person, but there are many exceptional people at the other end of this building, as there are in this house. And the role of an MP is not a job, it's a vocation. And at this moment, as we think of David's family, we should think of the sacrifice they have made. The endless phone calls on a Sunday afternoon about drains or someone's views or you're not getting your message across. Those who have been in the House of Commons will be very familiar with. The distractions, the inability not to go and see your children play sport, all of these things. It is a complete way of life. And the support which David had from his family is something we should all be profoundly grateful for. Mm -hmm. That he should be robbed of the chance of seeing his uh, children perhaps go on and produce grandchildren and, and, and have that joy of retirement was a particularly savage thing to have happened to such a nice man. Um, I looked at Hansard for just this year uh, to see what David had been saying. Endometriosis to forced adoption, car charging points to the Maldive fishing industry, motor and urine disease to night flying, knife crime to the operations yew tree, and of course the now celebrated city status uh, for South End. And of course, Vera Lynn, both great patriots and supporters of our country, and to the noble Lord, Lord Rogan, a fantastic supporter of our union of the United Kingdom. Uh, the uh, launch of the campaign for the statue of Vera Lynn uh, was a song called Irreplaceable, how ironic. David is irreplaceable as the people of South End. I hope that will not be used in the election, the by-election campaign um, <laughs> by anyone. Uh, he was irreplaceable. He was uh, a one-off. And I began to think um, what would have been appropriate as a song for David from Vera Lynn. When you hear Big Ben, you're home again, perhaps. And then I thought, actually, for David, with his hugely energetic campaigns, it's probably praise the Lord and pass the ammunition and we'll all stay free. <laughs> so what can I say about David Alton? Uh, sorry, David Alton. <laughs> about David Alton. David Alton and David Amos worked tirelessly in support of Christian persecution around the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should honor that by tackling these issues yeah, uh, yeah. and, and, and recognizing that it is in all our interests, in our country's interests, in our nation's interests, that we support freedom of expression and freedom of religious belief. David Amos was a champion of that. Wonderful tributes by people who knew Sir David much better than I did. But I just thought I'd put on the record very briefly messages that I picked up from his constituents. Jill Allen King, aged 82, who has uh, written about her guide dog and most recently asked me to do a foreword for her most recent book about being blind in lockdown. 
But in that book, she talks about Sir David, and when I phoned her and talked to her a couple of months ago, she described to me what a wonderful man he'd been, attending charitable dues when it would have been a lot easier not to, helping her with fundraising, being there at the drop of a hat. That was the measure of Sir David Amos, the man that I remember from 1992, like Lord Newby, because two or three days before the Sheffield rally, I went to Basildon campaigning, and it was patently obvious then that we'd lost. I knocked on doors, and it wasn't <coughs> just about whether people were going to vote Labour, they were going to vote for David. Uh, and I went back and uh, reported to headquarters that we were shot. And for, unfortunately for us, we were. I just want, want also to say to the Archbishop of York, Yes, we must not let hate succeed. There's a panorama programme on BBC television tonight. Why do they hate me so much? Yes, social media has whipped this up and made it more prevalent and more dangerous. But apart from those who are seriously mentally ill that Lord Clark referred to, we have a phenomena of hate which is about difference. It's about intolerance. It's about the way in which people can no longer have the dialogue which allows us to speak strongly, to think emotionally, to believe our values are worth fighting for, but to do so by upholding them in the spirit of democracy. And so often now, the hate isn't just for, and it certainly wasn't with Sir David, about an individual. It was about our system, our democracy, about the world around us. And one of the things that I picked up over the last few weeks about Sir David, which is very close to my heart, is about young people learning about politics and democracy, about citizenship and democracy, which he was becoming engaged with. If there's one thing we can carry forward, and I hope will bring comfort to his family and his close friends, it is actually to be able to teach our young people how to do democracy, how to be understanding, how to have very strong opinions, but to be able to express them in a way that is respectful to others as well as to themselves. If that comes out of this and people can have a dialogue across the country about how we make that work better, then Sir David's life, wonderful as it has been, will also be remembered for making another contribution like Joe Cox to changing the way in which we do our politics. My lords, my lords, may I make a very brief tribute uh, to David based on 32 years of shared friendship in the other place. As my noble friend Lord Howard said, he was basically loyal to his party and if I can speak briefly as a former chief whip of the 876 votes in the 2010 parliament, David supported the government on 97.6% of the time. Uh, no one could complain about that. But he was a man of strong principle, impervious to the bait of ministerial office, as my noble friend Lord Clark has said. And when he voted against the government, he did so on a matter of principle. Your Lordships may be interested to hear that he voted against the government on the House of Lords Reform Bill in 2011. Uh, he also voted against military action against Syria when the government was defeated, and he opposed the badger cull, animal welfare being one of his special subjects. More recently, he actually voted against the government on leaseholder compensation post the Grenfell tragedy, on which many of us may share his views. His uh, sunny optimism, revealed by that broad smile, his basic decency, his generosity, his modesty, made him a great colleague. And we see him walking briskly from engagement to engagement with a sheaf of pa papers under his arm, his timetable fractured, both here and in South End, by his willingness to stop and talk to colleagues. The shadow leader mentioned his uh, insistence that the House of Commons should not adjourn for the Christmas recess until it had answered 18 issues of great importance to the burghers of South End. Just pity the leader of the House replying to that debate. I mention one other um, factor about David. He was generous with his time and happy to visit and speak in the constituencies of Conservative MPs, an obligation often look, overlooked by his more self-important colleagues. And he was capable of mischief. He came to North West Hampshire, and the convention is that the visiting speaker 
pays a glowing tribute to the industry and energy of the incumbent, however well-funded in truth uh, that may be. <laughs> but there was none of that from David. Great to be here in George's patch, he began, but I don't want to waste time talking about him. I want to tell you about myself. <laughs> <laughs> my, lords, my lords, reading and listening to the tributes paid to David over the weekend, I asked myself if people would join the dots and link the tributes we pay today to David with those we paid last week to James Brokenshire and those we paid earlier to Joe Cox and realized that those public servants whom fate has cruelly taken from us too early are between them more representative of this country's often abused public servants than the bad apples who get us unfavorable publicity. Yeah. David's family have expressed the hope that some good should come from this tragedy. David was essentially a generous man, and he wouldn't mind sharing some of the tributes to him more broadly if it helped change the perception of the profession to which he has selflessly given his life. Yeah. Yeah. I did in 1983, but I first discovered uh, Sir David's fundamental decency, integrity and courtesy when I was a junior whip. Later, I was David's chief whip for four years, and I held him in the highest regard because he was the sort of MP we chief, chief whips liked and rated, not because he sycophantically voted for us for 96 or 97 percent of the time, but he always told us well in advance on the three percent of occasions when he could not because he was putting his conscience and his constituency priorities over, uh, and these prevailed over whipped votes. Uh, chief Whips can live with MPs who have that level of courtesy and decency. As has been said, my lords, he was deeply religious, and that clearly influenced his views on political issues. But he was always capable of seeing the other point of view. And he always disagreed with the viewpoint, not the person making it. And that is a sign of greatness and generosity of spirit. And he followed the great commandment of Jesus to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and your neighbour as yourself. Well, David loved 70,000 neighbours, all his constituents in South End West, and people further afield in the UK, and even further afield around the world, as has been said. In fact, those suffering in the world were David's uh, neighbours. And not just people as the great hymn by, Ale by Cecil Alexander says, all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. And if the Lord God made them, David Amos also defended them. <laughs> My lords, I say, and I say this carefully, I think uh, David died a Christian martyr. And I mean martyr in the proper Greek derivation of the term, meaning a witness, nothing else. He died a witness to his belief in the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity, and to their practical realization, including working until the very end for others. He did his duty to his God and family, his constituency, and his country. What truer passport is, to, is there to eternal life? And I was reminded of the opening of the anthem in Paradisum, which was sung at the, the funeral of Lady Thatcher, and it begins, May angels lead you into paradise. But there will be no resting in peace uh, for David Amos in paradise, for even now he will be campaigning amongst the angels and archangels for heaven to be granted city status. <laughs> <laughs> my lords, I pass on my sincere condolences uh, to Lady Amos, uh, to his children, and all those others who may have been traumatised at the time of the awful murder. It was a privilege to know him, and I, 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 I really liked serving him. Yeah. My lords, there is one aspect of uh, Sir David's work that is perhaps not very widely known. Every year for the last 30 years, he took into his office a young American student from the Catholic University of America. I had the honor of arranging the programs over those years, so I worked closely with him. He gave those young people a wonderful insight into British parliamentary democracy. Those young people who had perhaps met the senators they'd worked for on the Hill or the congressmen only once in a three or four month period saw Sir David every day. He took them to his constituency. They saw at first hand 
what it meant to be personally represented. They all benefited from that experience, and he made an intangible contribution to British-American relations in the process. My Lords, I had the uh, pleasure of uh, knowing David when I first got into the House in 1986 in a by-election. He was incredibly helpful to me at that particular time. Uh, I, like uh, uh, the, my two predecessors uh, in the Whip's office, as uh, Chief Whip, uh, got to know him over a period of time. I think it is fair to say that David followed two Whips. He followed the Conservative Whip and the Whip of the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church would always take precedence over the Conservative Whip. <laughs> However, it wasn't very often. I'm glad to say that they collided on parliamentary uh, occasions at any rate. Uh, David was a man of true belief and deep, deep conviction. And what happened to him last week, and his family asked why, I don't think there's an answer. It's random devastation. It's devastation that could almost affect any parliamentarian. Because David, as we've heard from today, the issues that he covered, the projects that he raised, the campaigns that he fought for the front of were so widespread, everybody could see what a superb constituency member of parliament he was. And, and one of the things about the House of Commons is we do have, sometimes we come across some very strange people. And I think they are well represented in Parliament <laughs> uh, overall. And, and Parliament is a stronger for it. And we've got to come across those people and we've got to meet those people and we've got to listen to them. Sometimes we might not listen for too long. But that's what I think, I hope his family can come to accept. It, wasn't a, it was obviously taking from them a husband and their father. And to them, that cannot be replaced but it was a random attack by an evil person. My yeah. Lord, may I also pay tribute to Sir David, whom I admired and with whom I had dealings over <coughs> many years. It would, my Lord, be a fitting tribute to him if all in both houses would emulate his gracious words and actions and avoid, as he did, Avoid aggressive words, false allegations, and visceral hatred. Such an improvement should also involve the media. This would be a great tribute to a great man, a loyal friend, and a fine Christian gentleman. Yeah, yeah. Lords, it's almost 40 years since the first meeting David and I attended on our respective roads to Westminster entering Parliament for marginal constituencies in 1983. He was a man who was constructive, committed, amusing and always willing to go the extra mile for you or indeed anyone who he felt he could help. We stayed close for many decades. Last week, at his request, I was with him on a delegation to Qatar where his charm and mischievous sense of humour deployed in a way only David could get away with in front of the most elevated in society was put to wonderful effect. It was so good to be with him. On asking the father Emir how many children he had and receiving the reply 24, he promptly reached for a small House of Lords picture frame as a gift and challenged him to fit all 24 into the frame. <laughs> and telling the Emir on receiving a copy of David's book that he could throw it in the waste paper basket led to more laughter and marked him out for being wonderfully self-deprecating. We flew out sitting together and flew back chatting away. The mission had been one of the most successful we had been on. His sensitivity and determination to help rehouse the 13 unaccompanied Afghan children with British family connections. His strong Catholic faith. His work as a strong supporter of Israel, yet always welcomed and respected in so many Arab countries. His ability to bring together and unite members of many a parliamentary delegation and the quips and the asides that always raised a smile were there for all to see. As co-founders and co-chairs of the All Party Group for the Olympics and Paralympics, we were planning a celebration for our Olympic and Paralympic medalists here in the Lords, an event he was much anticipating. And no surprise then to receive the following tribute from the President of the International Olympic Committee, Thomas Bach, who yesterday wrote, 
and I quote, Sir David fought keenly for sport and for all it could do. He understood that the Olympic Games are the only event that can bring the entire world together in peaceful competition. He worked tirelessly to keep the Games free of politics and dispute. David was a true friend. He proved that politics was more than the collective DNA of ministerial ambition. It is and has been said many times, not least in this House, about public service, about challenging and changing the lives of constituents, even in the smallest possible way, and to make a difference to your constituents and to the causes you felt passionately about was everything that David stood for, a decent, uplifting, unstintingly hard-working, kind man with a mischievous sense of humour, an outstanding parliamentarian and constituency MP, devoted husband to Julia and loving father to their children, and such a loyal friend and colleague to so many of us. At the end, doing what he loved best and what he was brilliant at, helping his constituents, not least realising his long-standing dream, the South End for which he long campaigned should be a city, both on earth and, God willing, in heaven. My lords, my lords. My lords, um, as I explained uh, earlier today, we have to uh, end this now because the House is going to join the House of Commons and uh, process at 5.30 behind the Lord Speaker to uh, St Margaret's. But, of course, I am aware that there are many other noble lords who would like to have paid tribute to Sir David today. Um, those members who have not had a chance to speak may email their speeches to Hansard by noon on Friday. Those speeches will be included in a special collection of tributes published by Hansard, which will be sent to Sir David's family. So, so now um, uh, I'm going to adjourn the House so we can join the procession um, starting at 5.30 from the Chamber. My Lords, I beg to move that the House to now adjourn. My Lords, members who wish to take part in the procession to the service in St Margaret's should wait in the Chamber as we prepare to leave in the next few minutes. The question is that the House do now adjourn. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.